Paladins will always stand out as a fan favorite in both Dungeons and Dragons and Baldur's Gate 3. And that is especially true of the Oath of Vengeance Paladin and the wild things you can do with a polearm which is kind of a wild statement too when you take it out of context. But in this video, I want to show you how to build my Fiery Avenger build that utilizes some of early fire damage that then swaps off of pure fire damage and onto some other fun mechanics. The reason behind this is that fire becomes heavily resisted in the latter portions of the game. So we abandon the heat mechanic for a lot of the more effective gear in the game. This build in its pure form is extremely viable for honor mode if you're looking for a hard hitting paladin build to take you through the hardest difficulty. I just kind of eschew some of the heat focused gear for more survivability or utility items. If this is your first time on my channel, the way I do things is by upfronting the knowledge of my videos so you can decide if it's the right one for you. So with that being said, we will be taking eight levels into Paladin using the Oath of Vengeance and then four levels into Fighter as either Battlemaster for a ton of additional abilities or Champion for just a raw ink to critical hit potential. Outside of that, we'll be focusing on three specific feats, Sentinel, Polearm Master, and Great Weapon Master. I'll be discussing how you'll address your feats, but that's really the primary focus of your build. So there's your too long didn't watch of this entire video. If that's all you wanted to know, please feel free to shut the video down and get back to creating your Paladin Avenger. Before you head out, please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Each one of those things does help me out in a huge way. I currently have something like 89% unsubscribed viewership on the channel, and that's a metric I'm trying to change this year, so every little bit helps. You can jump ahead to any part of the video that interests you the most using the chapters in both the timeline and the description. And if you need help with any other subject in Baldur's Gate 3, check out my playlist link to below at the end of the video, upper right corner, it's fucking everywhere. But let's get started here on the Fiery Avenger Paladin build for Baldur's Gate 3. As always, we start off with our character creation. So when it comes to race, please choose the race that makes the most sense for you, your character, and how you want to go about doing things. Don't worry about any of this from a min-max perspective because this is a single-player narrative game. So just have some fun with this. Great and role play for you, your character, and everything. You're just going to enjoy the game far more. Now, here are some standout options because I do quite like them for the build and the synergies we have in mind. So typically, I do not recommend Zariel Tiefling. And the reason behind that is you get three cantrips as a Tiefling, depending upon which sub-race you choose. With the Zariel Tiefling, you get Thaumaturgy, which is actually very good. Gain advantage on Intimidation and Performance checks. It's nice to just kind of have, right? The other two cantrips you get are Searing Smite and Branding Smite. You get both of those smites default as a Paladin just simply by leveling up. But what I like about the Zariel Tiefling, well, this is just not necessarily Zariel Tiefling, but any of the Tieflings, they get this, Hellish Resistance. You have resistance to fire damage, taking only half damage from it. So... If you want to go with a Mephistopheles Tiefling and get Mage Hand, which is actually extremely useful, by all means, go for it. Or as Modius Tiefling, uh, one of these gets Darkness, and I cannot remember off the top of my head. But Produce Flame for the Asmodeus Tiefling will actually be pretty handy. A flame in your hand sheds a light in a 30-foot radius and deals 1-8 to eight fire damage when thrown. So you have a way to pretty much throw some fire damage whenever you need to, and we will be using tons of fire damage in the game. And the Heat Mechanic... I'll show this off once we actually get into the gear portion and everything, does fire damage to your character. And the nice thing about a tiefling is you just kind of already have resistance to fire damage, taking only half the damage from it. So you mitigate a lot of the damage you're going to deal. Um, elves are kind of nice here, both high, uh, specifically high elves and half high elves, because they get access to cantrips, which can give you access to firebolt, which is just a way to do fire damage for this fire-based build. The thing to keep in mind, though, is that this does use intelligence, which sucks. But you can use blade ward instead and get access to this, because this will have your damage from bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing attacks, which can actually be pretty beneficial for this build. Outside of that, some other standout ones are dwarfs if you want to go with the gold dwarf to get increased hit points to make you a lot more tanky if you so wish. The half orc is a really good choice here as well because you get access to savage attacks. This is different than the feat savage attacker if you, in case you're coming from this as a veteran. When you land a critical hit with a melee weapon, you deal an extra dice of weapon damage. You get a whole bunch more damage coming out as a half orc and you get relentless endurance. If you reach zero hit points, you regain one hit point instead of being downed. We can get this effect from an amulet, but you can circumvent that by just having it built into your character by default, which is really good. 
Um, Gith are always a really good one here too because the Gith get access to a ton of different items throughout this game. There's a lot of really cool story and narrative options being a Gith. It's a sleeper race in the sense that not many people choose it, but a lot of build guide videos recommend them because this action is very good. Proficiency in all skills of a chosen ability. They get cantrips like Mage Hand. They get an enhanced leap. They have a lot of really cool stuff that they have access to. In addition to a ton of armor that is relegated purely to the race of Gith. So it's a really, really uh, great choice that not a lot of people go with, unfortunately. But my ultimate choice, because I just, if I were to play tabletop, it would be this character. It would be a Dragonborn Oath of Vengeance Paladin. I have That has been in my brain for years. So I would be remiss to not recommend this character because you get a fire breath attack that does 2 to 12 damage. The nice thing too is it scales with your level. It gets better every handful of, I think it's a 8 and 4, or whoa, what? It gets better at like level 8 and 12 or 5 and 9. It's something of the sort. But either way, this scales with you. It gets better. It's very strong. And you start off with a resistance to fire damage. Outside of the heat mechanic we've talked about, it's also the most prevalent damage in the game. So it's very nice to have that capability. For our class, we are, of course, going with Paladin, which is going to give us Divine Sense, gain advantage on attack rolls against Celestials, Fiends, and Undead, the latter two being very prevalent, especially towards the latter portions of the game. Lay on Hands, which is going to be a nice heal for you, which is going to be cool throughout the rest of the game. And your Channel Oath, which we'll talk about as we level our character up. For our subclass, we're going with Oath of Vengeance, which gives us Inquisitor's Might. You are an ally's weapon attacks, deal an additional two radiant damage, and can daze enemies for one turn. It's not the most amazing class action. Uh, we're looking towards our latter portions to really pull a lot of Oath of Vengeance. But the Oath of Vengeance gets a lot of really good spells as bound to the Oath that are very, very fun and really going to help you out with your mobility on the battlefield. Now, keep in mind, too, you are a paladin, so you have an oath and its tenets you must apply yourself to. The Oath of Vengeance specifically has fight the greater evil, exerting your wisdom, identify the higher morality in any given instance, and fight for it. The way I've always been, uh, uh, the, the Oath of Vengeance has been described to me is, of the three paladin oaths in this case, it's kind of, not necessarily the evil one, but it's always, you'll choose... The lesser of two evils, you know, like, hey, you know, if eradicating this town results in a whole entire city being saved or something of those sorts, it's kind of falls into the oath of vengeance. Like, it's a little bit more of a, a uh, ends justify the means type of character and less of like, a, I must uphold good for the righteousness of devotion. It's just a little bit more of a darker path, I suppose you could say. For your background here, we are going to go with whatever you choose from a roleplay perspective. Create a little backstory for your character. Have some fun with it, you know? Are you some sort of noble son that has joined into a paladin order? Are you a former criminal who has seen the air of their ways and somehow become a paladin? <laughs> are you a sage who has studied through tomes and tomes and tomes of knowledge and lore and has discovered themselves to be a student of, of a paladin order whatever it is please make a role play for your character because this kind of helps make those decisions a little bit more fun for you my min max choice though is always guild artisan for insight and persuasion having these bonuses online for you just initially is so so good which then brings us into our skills you know having them already clicked off is just a really nice way to kind of jump into stuff then you can put points here into intimidation which does fit into the persona of the oath of vengeance paladin uh, medicine and animal handling, or uh, it doesn't matter, animal handling, we're not talking about that. Um, religion actually is not a terrible choice here. Um, athletics is good. It's going to be geared towards shoving things, and that is a nice bonus action you can use to shove something off of a precipice. Just keep in mind, if you shove them into something that they fall to their doom, you do not get the loot. So just keep that in mind. Religion is not a bad one. There's plenty of little religion checks throughout the game, so I would definitely not not recommend it, but I would always make sure I've got something like persuasion or intimidation, some form of conversational skill, because we are a high charisma character, and that is going to really, really benefit us. For our ability points, we're going to be going with a high amount of strength and a good amount of charisma, as well as a stable amount of constitution. Not a huge investment in dexterity, though. The way I'm looking at this character is it's going to be a heavy armor build. I'm not going to be relying on the dexterity bonus of well, dexterity, my AC bonus from dexterity, and I'm going to focus more instead on the benefits of my stuff from strength. Strength is, of course, going to be what we're going to be doing the lion's share of our damage with, and charisma is going to help out all of our spellcasting capabilities as well as kind of lean into some of the other 
kind of class actions, I guess you could call them, of the paladin. They'll usually kind of come off of some sort of charisma bonus. Uh, say, for example, the aura that helps out with everyone's defense, it's going to come off of your charisma modifier. So we do want this number to be good and high. And same thing with our constitution, because it is our health pool, which is huge. But since we are a paladin, we have a ton of concentration spells, meaning that it will be a constitution check to see if the concentration of that spell does not break. 14 is good. I wish it could be higher, but we will fix that towards the end of the game with some really good items. And again, dexterity is just so that it's not a penalty, right? We don't want to have a minus one uh, to dexterity. It's nice. And also wisdoms at a 10 because we don't want a minus one to that as well because wisdom's going to govern things like old person, charm person. Uh, I think frighten is... Check. Basically, any a lot of the big heavier crowd control style of spells that are cast against you are against wisdom. So we want that to be good and high. So this is what I would recommend for your ability points. We're going to switch over now to my other character that is unfortunately a wood elf and not a dragonborn to progress through what this leveling up looks like. So the progression for this character is going to be locked pretty straightforward. In fact, to be totally frank with you, this is a very cookie cutter build. This is one that I, plenty of people have done videos and guides online for it's it, there, there's nothing here that's going to be totally unique i'm just going to be honest with you uh probably the more unique portions of the build are going to be focused on the heat mechanic but again we're going to kind of swap that off and you can still stick with it towards the latter portions of the game it's just kind of probably more in maxi to drop it so we're going to start off with first five levels here into paladin in fact we're going to stick here for almost all of them and this is important because it's going to get our two main feats online so right here at level two, we're going to get access to our Divine Smite, which is going to be great. It's going to scale with us. It's going to do plenty of damage, and it does radiant damage. While not heat, uh, or I'm sorry, fire damage, there's plenty of ways to buff and improve this. For our fighting style, we're definitely going to be going here with great weapon fighting. You can go with something like defense if you want, but we are going to be using great weapons, so we might as well pull a even more damage into them. And for our spells, just to kind of show off some of them... Um, your weapons attack, uh, divine favor is not bad because it kind of, it kind of jumps in with your class action. I just don't like that. It's a, a concentration ability and it only lasts for three turns. Um, if it was just kind of lasted for something like 10 turns, like bless, I would like it a little bit more, but stuff like protection from good and evil is good. Shield of faith is nice just to get yourself additional armor class. The smites are pretty good too, just to give you access to this damage type. Just keep in mind doing this costs an action and a bonus action. Searing Smite here deals an extra 1 to 6 fire damage and sets your target on fire. It takes 1 to 6 fire damage every turn. So this can work in conjunction with a lot of the heat stuff we have in mind. Um, heroism is also very nice. Target's immune to Frighten, gain 5 temp hit points. It's nice in the beginning of the game, but you start to run into so many forms of temp hit points that it kind of gets jam jammed up pretty easily. Um, Wrathful Smite 2, 2 is also very good just to get access to another Psychic uh, another form of damage in Psychic, which can be helpful towards the latter portions of the game. But also the early portions, too, just to kind of frighten things is always nice. Um, but that is kind of what we're going to stick here with. We're going to go keep jumping through our levels. Get into Paladin level 3. Where we get Divine Health. So now it prevents diseases from affecting you. And we get two of our big actions. The first one is Abjure Enemy. Frighten an enemy. They'll have disadvantage on ability checks and attack rolls. And they cannot move. Fiends and Undead have disadvantage on this saving throw, which is always really cool, right? This is a channel oath capability. Same thing here with Vow of Enmity. Gain advantage on attack rolls against an enemy, which is nice too, right? Because what I like about this is, this is an action, whatever, that kind of sucks, but this is a bonus action and it lasts for 10 turns. So you can cast this before you do a big alpha strike. And when we talk about uh, the fighter and how we can really stack a lot of damage in, it's cool because we just outright get an advantage on attacks against a target, which is just really, really sick. As far as our oath spells go, we get Bane, which is nice just to kind of help out with some attack rolls. It is a concentration ability. Same thing with Hunter's Mark, which also is a concentration ability. But it just adds more flat damage, which is just kind of cool, right? It's one to six more damage anytime you hit with a weapon attack. It's pretty cut and dry and simple, and I like it for that very same reason. Uh, more spells here. Command isn't bad, especially in the early portions of the game, especially if you're on honor mode. Just have someone drop a weapon and take the weapon from them. It's it's actually pretty goddamn useful. So we'll take that and we'll keep moving on. Um, again, we get more more spells. You can pop those in. But now, ooh, 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 wait, wait, wait. Yes, I was like, do we get another thing here? No, we don't. 
now we get a feat. So let's talk about feats. So typically in these videos, I go through a number of feats you can choose, but I'm not going to do that here. Well, you know what, I will a little bit, but my the focus of this build is on three specific feats. And if you take a look at them, we're going to use Polearm Master. When attacking with a Glaive, Halberd, Quarterstaff, or Spear, you can use a bonus action to attack with the butt of your weapon, which can also be a smite. You can smite with this, which is cool. Uh, you can also make an opportunity attack when a target comes within range. So what we do is we take Polearm Master and double it with Sentinel. When an enemy within melee range attacks an enemy, you can use a reaction to make a weapon attack against that enemy. So basically, they come within range of you because of Polar Master. You get to do an opportunity attack. And now you gain advantage on opportunity attacks. So this all this kind of comes together so well that you can just lock things down. You have really good uh what's it zone zone control or whatever the hell the term is that I can't think of off the top of my head. So you can do just so much stuff and you can use this on allies. So it gives you a lot of really fun capabilities that are less of a defensive kind of way of being a paladin, but you get to be more of like an offensive defensive paladin, right? When an enemy within melee range attacks an ally. So you can, oh, hey, reaction, I'm going to go slam that ally, that, that, what the, uh, uh, the target, wait, slam the enemy of my ally <laughs> with your, your big burly polearm. So those are your big two that you're going to focus on. But first, we're going to get Great Weapon Master. And what we're going to do is respect this character. We're going to go to Withers and say, hey, change my class. And we're going to respect the character out of Great Weapon Master into Polearm and Sentinel Master once we've reached a specific point in the game. Once you reach Act 2, Moonrise Tower, you will get a specific weapon, Halberd. I'll show you in the gear section. That's when you respec. Because then you can probably at that point, you're around level 7, almost level 8. And once you get to level 8, you can get both of these and turn them on. Great Weapon Master, we will get, but we'll get it again at level 12. I know that's confusing, so I'm going to re-say it right here. We're going to start the game, level 4, Great Weapon Master. Then once we get to the Moonrise Towers in Act 2, we're going to get a specific halberd. And then we're going to respec our character at level 8 to be... Sentinel and Polearm Master for our two feats. And then level 12, we will pick up Great Weapon Master. Now, if you don't want to focus on polearms, and you just want to use two-handed swords and weapons and all that fun action, you definitely can. I would pick up stuff like Heavy Armor Master to increase my strength, but also negate damage by three. Ability Improvement to just put it into strength or into charisma, whatever it may be. Those are just really, really nice all-around capabilities. Savage Attacker is great. When making melee weapon attacks, you roll your damage dice twice and use the highest result. So you can get a lot of really great capabilities here. Even using Resilient Constitution is great because then you get your proficiency bonus added into your uh, concentration saving rolls. This is a really cool capability. So just to kind of show off some of the other ways that you could approach this character that aren't specifically focused on sentinel approach but like i said we will be doing that so that is what i'm going to be doing for this character so again you'll start with great weapon master then respec and go sentinel pull arm into level five though we get a little bit of a power spike we get our extra attack online this is going to allow us to do two attacks per one of our primary actions so when we go to attack something we'll attack twice which is lovely we're going to get now our level two spell slots and we get more oath spells namely hold person which is very very strong um, and we get Misty Step. Misty Step is great because it's going to give us a lot of mobility. We can get Misty Step from tons of items, but it's nice just to have this as a spell as well. And as far as our spells go, we get access to Branding Smite, which does that radiant damage, but also prevents things from turning invisible, and Magic Weapon. Magic Weapon is cool is bec uh, because it can stack with a lot of items that say, hey, there's a specific halberd that's, uh, that will give you... It'll increase the damage of your dragon breath attacks if you choose a dragonborn. And you can imbue an item with an, a specific element. But you can also cast magic weapon on that too. So it can stack with a lot of uh, really fun effects to give you even more out of um, all of your enchanted weapons. It's just, again, it's a concentration ability. Just, it would do something like that probably. Go ahead and accept that. And push forward into level 6. 
where we will get Aura of Protection. You and nearby allies gain a bonus based off of your Charisma modifier to saving throws. This is just a nice kind of AoE little buff to all of your bros. And you also have access to stuff like Lester Restoration, Protection from Poison, which can be nice when you're dealing with a bunch of traps, and Aid, which is just a spell. <laughs> just going into level 7. We get one of the most important features of this build, and it is why we are choosing Sentinel and Polar Master. It is Relentless Avenger. If you hit an enemy with an opportunity attack, your movement speed increases by 15 on your next turn. This is, again, why we're focused on those two feats, because we have opportunity attacks coming out of our ass. We can do opportunity attacks whenever someone comes in range, whenever someone attacks an ally in melee range, and when someone enters out of an opportunity attack with us, right? If they leave our melee range, we can use this. So those three ways of incurring opportunity attacks allow us to get this huge bonus to our movement speed. So we're just always going to be on the run and able to move around quite a bit. Again, here too, we have all of our spells. We'll accept this for our final level into Paladin, and we are good to go. We can pick up our feet. Go ahead and choose Sentinel here. So before we make this pivot, you can actually, if you want, go five levels into Paladin, four levels into Fighter, and then the rest into Paladin. This is the most straightforward, easiest way to approach this character, and it's why I did it this way. You can break this up if you want, but it's always suggested that if you're going with a melee build, you do the first five levels of that melee character to get your extra attack. Now that we're character level nine, we move into fighter. Now this is going to give us an additional fighting style, which I think the best and easiest one is defense. But you can also use protection. No, you cannot. I thought that I, I thought that was. Uh, regardless of whether or not you had a shield. So we're, we're going with defense. <laughs> Almost made a bad suggestion. But we're going to get second wind here. You draw on your stamina to heal yourself. It's just a free heal for a bonus action. You can't go wrong there. And it'll get better as we pull more levels of the fighter. In level two, we'll get action surge, which is going to greatly increase your combat capability. Immediately gain an extra full action to use this turn. It is a huge boon. And then at level three, we get to make a choice. You can choose between going with Battle Master or Champion. If you want a character that's a little bit more just kind of on the rails, you don't have to think about using all these abilities because you're going to have a ton as a Paladin as it is. Just go with Champion because this simply does this. The number you need to roll a critical hit while attacking is reduced by one. And we can choose a ton of items to further stack this so that you can have critical hits on 19 and 20, which is just Champion, or... 18, 19, and 20 with a, a bow equipped. There's a lot of ways to make this really, really pull out a lot of big numbers for you. But for this character, I'm going to go Battle Master because why not add a whole bunch of crazy shit to the character? This gives us maneuvers. So I like Repost here. When a hostile creature misses you with a melee attack, expend a superiority die to retaliate with a powerful strike that deals an additional 1d8 damage. It's just basically weaponizing anytime someone misses, which is huge. Now, some big standout ones are Trip Attack to knock things prone. Again, getting that 1d8 uh, bonus to damage. Pushing Attack to move things 15 feet away from you. Precision Attack, you can spend a Superiority Die. Whoa, Superiority Die. <laughs> to add it to the result on an attack roll. I really like that one. Maneuvering Attack is cool to just kind of hand out movement speed to allies. Ooh, where is it? Disarming attack is very good. Then a superiority die to make an attack that deals an additional 1d8 again. But it possibly forces the target to drop the weapon they're holding. I like this if I'm doing like say honor mode where I just really want to get the weapon out of the hand of a lot of things. It, it really, really, really is useful. Um, a big one is fainting attack. But the thing I don't like about this is you use both your action and bonus action on a turn to attack a target with advantage and deal a 1d8 damage. We already have ways to give advantage to our character, so I just don't find this as useful as, say, pushing attack or trip attack or disarming attack. So go with whatever kind of additional effects you want to uh, apply to enemies. Do you want to knock them prone more often? Then go with trip. Do you want to disarm them? Then go with disarming. Trip, I think, is a little bit more useful in the latter portions of the game, whereas disarming, I think, is better in the beginning of the game. Personal opinion. It'll still be useful very much throughout the entire game, if you still wish. And our last level, we're going to pick up 
Great Weapon Master to finish off our character. Now, keep in mind, too, with Great Weapon Master, when you land a critical hit or kill a target with a melee weapon, you can make another melee weapon attack as a bonus action that turn. So if you went with Champion, you get a lot of value out of this, out of just simply, oh, you, I, I crit with one less? That doesn't seem as beneficial. It turns on some other fun stuff for you. Also, attacks with melee weapons you are proficient with are wielding the, and are wielding in both hands can deal an additional 10 damage at the cost of a minus 5 attack roll penalty. So you would toggle this in the passive section of your uh, character, on or off, depending on if you're hitting a, the boss or not. Bosses will typically have something like a flat, like, oh, it's already like 45% chance to hit them. If you have this turned on, uh, now it's like 22%, whatever. I'm making up numbers here, right? So you turn that off. You actually have a likelihood to hit them versus everything else you probably keep it on to just smash the hell out of them so this is our character build let's take a look at some gear and how the paladin overall works so as far as our character goes this paladin these fighter abilities we have a ton to choose from right and just to kind of quickly go over this you do have your superiority die because i am a battle master but you click this and it would just kind of give you all of our superiority die actions but taking a look at our lay on hand charges, this now is a nice juicy 32 heal bomb that we can just use whenever someone's in a pinch. I probably wouldn't use this very often because my character is focused on damage and this is a melee based heal. So you have to be up close and personal, but it is there nonetheless. Now for our channel oath charges, we still have our Inquisitor's Might. Um, this is dealing additional three radiant damage and can daze enemies for one turn. I, it's fine. I just don't really like to use it. I'd rather use Bow of Enmity. Gain advantage on an attack rolls against a specific enemy for 10 turn. Really nice capability. Has a 10 foot range. So you'd probably use this right before you actually want to go through your series of ma massive major attacks into them, right? And in addition to just those capabilities, as a paladin, we have, here we go, Aura of Protection. We would cast this and it's just on now. It's up. So as long as people are within 10 feet, they will get this bonus from us. So just keep those things in mind because you want to make sure you're, you're using them and you're not just like not, not, not using half the benefit of being a paladin. Two as well, you want to make sure you have your uh, reaction set properly. You want to make sure the game asks you about divine on a critical hit rather than just going ahead and doing it. Because if I'm going to critical hit something, they've got one health. I'm not going to waste the Divine Smite on it, right? Because remember, Divine Smite is going to pull from your spell slots. And when it pulls from your spell slots, it's going to upcast the ability. So what I mean by that is, go ahead and take a look at level one. Level one Divine Smite, as is, is going to do, ignore that poison damage, uh, 2d8 radiant damage deals an additional 1d8 to fiends and undead. But if I click level two here, and I click... Where is this? Go. There we go. It will now deal an additional 1d8. So it'll do the difference between 2d8 or 3d8 radiant damage, which is a significant amount of damage that you're going to be throwing onto the character. Um, and it will really be nice here. And again, since we're focusing on stuff like critical hits from maybe champion, this gets you the ability to just use this as a reaction, just layers in so much goddamn damage into the character too. Um, as well, I wanted to focus on this real fast precision attack. Your next weapon attack gets an attack bonus equal to your superiority die. So this will is it's kind of like it gets less and less good as you go as you use it, right? Because if I use this right now, it uses the superiority die and that number goes down. You can choose the uh, martial adept feat, which gives you superiority die and gives you more maneuvers, um, but. It's not really the big focus of this build, just wanted to show off that you can do that. But this is the reaction for that as repose here. When a creature misses, blah, 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 you would have that either ask you or just shut it off, whichever one you want. You probably want to have them ask you though. So those are all of our abilities. Let's talk about our gear. As far as weapons go, we're going to focus on two weapons that I actually don't have. The first one is the Everburn Greatsword. You're going to get this in the very beginning of the game. If you missed it there, unfortunately you missed it throughout the entirety of your playthrough. But when you see the general on the Nautiloid ship, you're going to use Shadow Heart to use the spell command, have the character drop their weapon and have someone else pick it up. It is gonna last you all the way up until we get our main halberd that acts as the pretty much the focal point of the entire build. So you can use that weapon up until act two, and then you swap over to the other one. 
Now, another weapon that I don't have is the Hellfire Great Axe. So if you want to stick with the heat mechanic and doing fire damage, then use this weapon. You get it in Act 3. You're going to get it in the uh, in like the Sorcerer's Vault. It does 1d6 additional fire damage. Whenever you deal damage with this weapon, you gain two turns of heat. It's a plus two weapon, and it has a special cleave attack that actually makes things vulnerable to fire. It, well, it ignores their fire resistance. So it's a really great weapon to lean into that fire direction if you want to do it. That you just go ahead and grab the Hellfire Great Axe and skip out on all the full arm stuff. Now, outside of that, we have one other weapon you can use. It's the Exterminator's Axe. You're going to get access to this in the uh, end of the first act in the Underdark, the, the Dwegar who kind of tells you to go destroy the Myconoid colony. He would give you this. And it does 1d6 fire damage. So this would basically replace your Everburn Greatsword if you did not get it, right? You could just use this up until you get the main weapon of the build, the Halberd of Vigilance. So again, a plus, a plus, a plus one bonus to initiative rolls, which is awesome, and advantage on perception ability checks, always cool, but adroit reflexes is a big one. When you make an attack roll as a reaction, you make it with advantage. So your repost now as far as a being a battle master has advantage. Whenever you do that opportunity attack for someone in range, uh, you have advantage. You already have advantage on your opportunity attack. So basically this thing is going to carry you throughout the entirety of the game if you don't want to use pole arms just use any really good two-handed weapon you get like if you want to switch over and use like this the the Baldurin, Baldurin's giant slayer you can definitely do it the sword of chaos you can definitely do it you can use the hellbeard halberd whatever you want if you don't want to use pole arms specifically as their feet are pertained or pertaining to their feet just go ahead and jump into any other now, as far as your gear goes, I am also going to focus first on the items I don't have. So in the beginning of the game-ish, you can get the Thermo Arcanic Gloves. You're going to get these this in like the Lost Battlefield in Act 2. But these gloves, whenever you deal fire damage, you gain two turns of heat. And we're going to talk about heat in a little bit here. And then lastly, we have the Ring of Immolation. And this ring will basically do damage to yourself, but then also give you two turns of heat. We're basically stapping, stacking up as much heat as possible so that we can lean into um, another mechanic. Oh, and also we have the Cinder Moth Cloak, a creature that damages the wearer within two meters receives burning. So now you just put things on fire for a little bit, which is, which is just really cool. And another item I had to edit in after the fact here is the Periapt of Wound Closure. This is what allows us to basically be what a half orc can do, right? When downed, automatically stabilized at the state of the start of the turn. And also this nice one, potent healing, maximize the number of hit points restored. I don't have this item, but it is a really great way to get a lot of survivability. And you simply get this in act one in the mountain pass. So it's a great thing to get online very early in the game. So what is all this heat BS that I keep talking about? So here's the cinder shoes here, right? Whenever you burn an enemy, you gain two turns of heat. This is one of the items I recommend. So heat, engulfed by a vengeful fire, takes one to four fire damage each turn, but can use heat convergence. So you take that fire damage. This is why I recommend if you start with like the Dragonborn or any of the three tieflings, you get access to resistance to this. So you don't take a lot of damage at all. You take half that damage, right? So heat convergence. The next time you deal fire damage, you deal an additional one fire damage for every turn of heat remaining. So basically you consume this and just do a ton more additional fire damage every single turn you decide to do that fire damage or a heat convergence. You just kind of layer this in, right? And if you're using any of these heat-based uh, weapons, it just layers into their already existing one plus one D6 of fire damage or one D4 in the Everburn Greatsword, for example. So this just allows you to really lean into that damage. And just doing this, for example, whenever you burn an enemy, you gain two turns of heat. That Cinder Moth Cloak burns enemies within two feet of you, giving you two turns of heat. And we have this, the Fire Heart. Whenever you take fire damage dealt by another creature, you gain two turns of heat. So you can see that we really lean into it, especially in the early portions of the game, because you can just, you can really abuse it. You can really add a ton of heat fire damage into yourself to just drop nukes on people. Those thermoarcanic gloves. Uh, whenever you deal fire damage, you gain two turns of heat. So you're constantly dealing fire damage to yourself 
or using your weapon to deal fire damage. So there, like I said, heat is not going to be an issue for you. You'll build it in so many resources and then just drop it as thermonuclear, uh, thermodynamic, arcanic, nukes, every, whatever the hell. So those are some of the, the big standout gear that you can use in a lot of the very early portions of the game. You're going to get all that stuff and pretty much this build comes online middle of act two. As soon as you get that halberd, you're pretty much set. Everything else just kind of makes things a little bit better in one, one direction or another. So talking about starting off with our helmets, we have the helmet of smiting you'll get in the very beginning of the game in act one in the underdark. When you apply a condition with one of your smite spells, which you're going to do because you're using a burning weapon, you gain temp hit points equal to your charisma modifier. So plus three temp hit points. Um, another really good helmet here too is the flawed hell dust helmet. The wielder has plus two bonuses saving throws against spells, constitution saving throws, all that. Towards the end of the game in Act 3, you'll get access to the Helldusk Helmet. You can see a magical darkness, which is really good, so you pretty much can never be blinded. The wielder has a plus two bonus save uh, to saving throws against spells. You can't be crit hit, which is really, really cool. Also, you have Immolating Gaze. Seer and Frighten a target with nothing but your Glower. You deal an additional 2 to 16 fire damage against burning creatures, which you're just doing tons of anyway. So... You're burning things, you're lighting stuff on fire, you are the Fiery Avenger. And also Saravox Helmet too makes it so that you can help out with that uh, Dark Vision. Number you need to roll a crit hit is reduced by one. You can't be frightened and Constitution Saving Throw increased by one. Into our cloaks, the Cloak of Protection, just very simple. Plus one armor class, plus one saving throw. That Cinder Moth Cloak we talked about too that does burns targets. Uh, the Cloak of Elemental Absorption, this basically you absorb an element you get hit with and then you deal an additional 1d6 of that element type on your next attack. It has to be a melee attack though. So this benefits this build a lot. So if you're taking a lot of fire damage, you can supercharge your fire damage out with this cloak. For our chest piece, I actually really like the Dwarven Splint Mail. It's very easy to get at the beginning of Act 3 in Rivington or at the end of Act 2, I can't recall. But you take one less piercing damage, gain... Plus one bonus to, oops, to uh, strength saving throws, disadvantage on stealth, who cares, but you get plus two constitution. So it's just free health for you, right? Now at the end of act one, you can get the adamantine splint mail. This is the scale mail. So this is the medium armor. So just get the heavy armor version. All incoming damage is reduced by two with that armor. And when a attack hits you, the target is sent reeling for two turns. Uh, reeling, recover from receiving a terrible blow or hitting a strong metal has a minus one penalty to attack rolls for every turn remaining. So it just is a nice way to mitigate a lot of damage towards you, and you can't be crit hit when you're wearing that armor. Um, towards the end of the game, though, Helldusk armor is amazing. Uh, when you succeed a saving throw, the caster receives burning for three turns. So it just adds tons of burning, right? This is probably the best armor to wear for this build. And you have resistance to fire damage and cannot be burned. You take three less damage from all sources. All sources all sources also you can fly so there is uh in the tabletop it's like level 10 or 12 or whatever the hell it is uh, that the uh it's 14 that the oath of vengeance paladin can sprout wings and fly this is basically your way to do for our gloves we have the gloves of heroism that you'll also get an act one when you use your channel oath spells you gain heroism which we've talked about but you can't be frightened receive five hit points per turn and it lasts for 10 turns so it's a good spell here to have it just kind of auto triggers and channel oath. Also, too, gauntlets of surging accuracy are going to be great once you get that second level of fighter. When you use action surge, gain a 1d4 bonus to action rolls for the rest of your turn. So, to kind of illustrate how this would work the best, you would use vow of enmity. Uh, vow of enmity. Gain advantage on attack rolls against an enemy. Then you would use action surge. Now you've got two. Uh, action to use and you get a 1d4 bonus to attack rolls for the rest of the turn if your character is already blessed by another target that's an additional 1d4 and now you've got two full actions of four swings coming out of you that have all the bonuses of these surging accuracy gloves you don't use them you don't attack with your primary action then use action surge and then attack again because you've just basically you mitigated half of the bonus of this of these gloves so they're really really awesome gloves when you use um, action surge. Also, Legacy of the Masters is great, plus two bonus to attacks and damage rolls with weapons. It's just a flat bonus. It's really good. Um, I took them off this character, but these are, these are really good too. Gauntlets of the War Master. Targets have disadvantage on saving throws against your maneuver and weapon attacks, which you will use in spades because you are a battle master. And for some reason that... 
There's this helmet too, which I forgot to show off, is the Helm of Balderon. The helmet heals you for two points every hit, uh, every turn, plus one bonus to armor class and saving throws. You can't be stunned, you can't be crit. It's a really awesome helmet too. I don't know why I didn't showcase it, but it's another awesome helmet. Back to gloves, we have the Hell Dust gloves here. Um, the big thing that the focus is, your weapon attacks deal an additional one to six fire damage. So you can really layer in all this fire damage with that Hellfire Great Axe. Really, really, really focusing on it um, and just going hard in the paint, even the latter portions of the game. You'll just have such a disgusting amount of fire damage coming out that even if it gets resisted, which is, you know, half that damage, you're still doing quite a bit. And if you're a Dragonborn and they resist your Dragon Breath attack, it still does half damage. The Hellfire Great Axe ability, if they uh, if it misses or whatever, it still does half damage from the, the tooltip. I can't remember now, 100%. Right, now, I'm, now I'm doubting my knowledge. We talked about the Cinder Shoes, but we also have the Boots of Persistence. You gain Freedom of Movement and Long Strider, which is awesome. Freedom of Movement is a really great ability here. You can't uh, Movement speed can't be reduced by difficult terrain, spells, or magical effects. You can't be paralyzed or restrained. So good. In Act 1, you'll get the Disintegrating Nightwalkers in um, the Underdark. Can't be unwebbed, entangled, or ensnared, and you get Misty Step. So now you can use this rather than act, the Misty Step from these boots rather than actually using a spell slot. And those spell slots are a currency which you can use to smite things with. Also, the Blackguard Greaves, uh, Blackguard, I believe actually is what it is, um, are Greaves you can get in Act 3 when you go to do the Ball Quest. Um, you gain Long Strider, you, which is pretty much half the benefit of the Boots of Persistence, right? So... The boots of persistence you have to buy, and they're pretty expensive. These you just simply find. Uh, if you want these boots of persistence, cast friends on Damon in Act 3, and you can buy them at half the cost. And there's also the armor of persistence, which I have not showcased. Here it is right now, that you can use too as a heavy armor. Um, it's got all of its benefits of like blade ward and resistance here, um, but I wanted to focus on a couple different heavy armors. I usually almost always show this one off. Outside of that, though, we have our jewelry. So the one that you probably want to focus on is the Amulet of Greater Health. This sets your constitution to 23, and you get advantage on constitution saving throws, making it so that any time you go to do those concentration checks, you're probably, probably going to always pass them since your constitution is so high and you have advantage on rolling against them. It's just going to be so huge. But leading up to that, Fire Heart is really good here. Whenever you take fire damage dealt by another creature, you gain two turns of heat. And Amulet of the Harpers is always one of my favorite. Advantage on Wisdom saving throws for anything that tries to uh, reduce your... And then tries to CC you, and you get shield. So just a nice way to kind of give some defensive mitigation. As far as our rings go, uh, the Crusher's Ring is good. Very early in the game in Act 1, you'll buy from the Goblin Camp. And then the Ring of Free Action you can buy from Blurg? in the Myconoid Colony in Act 1 still, and you can buy it, buy it again in Act 3, depending on what you do. But you can ignore the effects of difficult terrain and cannot be paralyzed or restrained. Really, really, two really strong in the beginning. Uh, Ring of Regeneration just gives you a free heal every single turn, which is cool. And then to the Killer Sweetheart, which is an auto crit hit. When you kill a creature, your next attack roll will be a critical hit. Once spent, this effect refreshes every long rest, but you can just bank this on whenever you want. It'll The game will keep asking you. Say, no, not now, not now, not now, until you really want to do it. You have an auto crit hit whenever you need. And lastly, um, we've already talked about our cloaks. I want to talk about our range weapon slot. So you can get the dead shot. It's probably one of the better in slots if you want to focus on those crit rolls, right? The dead shot, the number you need to roll a crit hit while attacking is reduced by one. This effect can stack. You would take the dead shot and Saravox helmet and the fact that you're a champion, and now you crit hit, not on a 20, not on a 19, not on an 18, but a 17 all the way through those other numbers. So 17, 18, 19, 20, you crit hit. So you are way more likely to drop some serious bombs with this build if you go champion and kind of stack onto these crit hit items. There's more crit hit items you could really work on, but I don't want to just show that one off. The one I probably recommend is when you also get an Act 2, the Drake Fire Short Bow. The damage is whatever but you gain resistance to fire damage. So if you were not a tiefling, you were not a um, a dragonborn, you now have fire resistance for the rest of the game. You also get resistance to cold, which is cool, but another uh, another good thing here is you get haste. So basically you get a potion of haste that you can use every long rest right here, bound into your character. You gain an action, become faster, and gain two uh, to your armor class. So it's a really, really strong build. 
that can really shine with a lot of really great capabilities. So I just wanted to showcase all this gear before we show off what this combat looks like. But I unfortunately don't have all the really cool heat items to show this off, but I just wanted to kind of showcase a little bit of how, how this works. So um, we're going to go ahead and go ahead go this. So heat conversions consume your heat. I've got three charges of heat right now. Um, so they, I'm going to take damage, but they can use heat convergence. So I take damage and deal one fire damage for every turn remaining. I had four when I started this, but I messed it up a little. Oh, that's not here or there. So I'm going to press this button. And now we're ready to do damage with something, right? So um, let's go ahead and use this during spine in specific. I mean, we could go ahead and do something like this, right? To even further fuel a powerful attack. But I'm going to go ahead and use this right. It's probably going to move. We're going to find out right now. I'm going to save and reload every time this fails. Let's see. Oh, so that went through. Now, of course, you do less damage because it's a companion. That That is worth noting here, right? So just to kind of show this off right here, attack roll, blah, 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 blah. And it shows off our Infernal Acuity, our Great Weapon Master, our Proficiency, our all that attack roll falls into this for damage roll, Strength Modifier, Great Weapon Master, all in. Well, that's just the raw damage of the weapon does 16. Then we did an additional 6 damage because of our Infernal Touch of our gloves and our heat. Then we did an additional 9 damage because of that heat convergence. So, oh, and also the 1d6 from our actual weapon attack. So you can see that this layers up very, very, very well. And it can do quite a bit of damage. And this is just showing off what if we wanted to go with just two-handed weapons and not use our pull arms. So I wanted to kind of give you an idea of how this all works before showing off the actual gameplay when we fight against the pull arms. Well, let's jump into some combat and show how all of this together. I'm going to go ahead and just skip my turn here as Karlak. Usually I start this with my character already active, but I want to show off a little bit how some of the defensive capabilities of this build work. <clears throat> so we're waiting for things to kind of go ahead and, oh, wow, oof, that was rough. Sorry, Karlak. We're waiting for things to move in and out of range, as it were, and all sorts of stuff. Oh, I don't know, it almost got out of range. Fine, that's why we have him just kind of planted right here in the middle. So they just went ahead and missed against me, right? So we can go ahead and use repost here. That will allow me to do some damage. Now, I do want to kind of hold off here because we are limited in the amount of damage we can do, or the amount of reactions we can do per turn, as we see. Oop, as we see, <laughs> reactions such as opportunity attacks are responses you have to events. Reactions can trigger both during and outside of your turn. I'm going to not react here, but otherwise we would do a repost and do some damage. So we'll skip that and see what happens with some of the other characters and if they go ahead and do anything within our turn. And sometimes you kind of get this weird bug where just nothing happens, but we're going to go ahead and ignore that as it kind of pushes itself very slowly into the next character. Fist, there we go, Fist Jepson. Now, uh, ah, that would have been, a, that if that had hit, which I should not have done a warding attack. Oh, damn, I thought it was in range. So you can see my range for attack is pretty huge. I thought this character was in my range, and they are just not. So we're going to move over here. That's fine, he's going to have an opportunity attack. No big deal. We want this ally to be within range of us. There we go. Now, with this character, we have plenty of things to do. Now, take this character, uh, Gauntlet of Wayana, for example. I went ahead and used a Potion of Quickness. So I've got two actions here to just show off a little bit of what do. But I'm going to go ahead and use my actions. And because we have those Surging Accuracy buffs, you can see Burst of Accuracy, you have a 1d4 bonus to attack rolls after using Action Surge. So we can really get crazy with it. So I'm going to go ahead and use Valve Enmity, which is going to use our bonus action. You know what? Yeah, we'll use it. Character. So now we have advantage in all of our attack rolls. As you can see, now I have a 96% chance to hit. We talked about this a little bit in the uh, feet section, but I wanted to turn this off. I now have a 99% chance to hit. So this is just going to make sure we do a lot of damage. And... I'm going to go ahead too and press this button. 
sort of divine smite. Now you can have this bound to reactions and everything, but I'm just trying to specifically create a, a circumstance here. So we're gonna go ahead and do this. Now, because of my halberd, I'm also doing force damage here, which is pretty cool. This is gonna do 21 to 54. There's a chance that I'm just gonna outright kill her. Ooh, I didn't. She got pretty, pretty lucky there. And don't worry, we can still do even more damage. Um, so you know what, with that bonus action, or with that action we get from our uh, additional attack, I'm gonna do this and just sweep right through things and we hit stuff. Like I said, I turned on the reaction for Divine Smite. So now that just does a little bit more right there. She's one of our little level one uh, abilities. We killed this character, but we now have all this other stuff we can do. I can now add precision attack into this. And you know what? Let's get kind of horny. Let's trip this dude. No, let's trip him. Ooh, missed him. Let's go ahead and try it again. Man, this guy is spicy. Either way, we missed both those attacks, which is not a great showing for a video displaying the combat capabilities of the character. And if you miss a um, battle maneuver, you can see on miss does not spend superiority die. There we go. You know what? Let's just let's just make this. There you go. Blow them up even further with our Divine Smite. And we still have more action here we can do. So we can go ahead and just follow this through with another attack on this character. Of course, wh why wouldn't we miss for the display of some? We're going to go ahead and take a turn. And there it is. Pull our Master Opportunity Attack. So make an Opportunity Attack whenever a creature enters your reach. Prerequisite must be wielding a Glaive, Halberd, Quarterstaff, or Spear. Let's go ahead and do that. And now... Relentless Avenger just triggered, right? Because we are a Oath of Vengeance Paladin. You have plus 15 uh, feet bonus to your movement speed. Um, you can see the grip portion. But we can do Divine Spike and do even more damage. Now that character can't move too because they went within our opportunity attack range. And let me, let me switch over to character here to show that off. Sentinel. When you hit a creature with an opportunity attack, it can no longer move for the rest of its turn. So that character might have been trying to push through me, but we were able to shut it down completely. And when an enemy within melee range attacks an ally, you can use a reaction to make a weapon attack against that enemy too. So we have tons of utility built into this character. It's meant to be a reaching character that shuts down things, has a good zone control, can really do a lot of spicy bits of damage. And now on my next turn, I'm gonna have a ton of mobility to do whatever I want. I'm gonna keep Karlak in range and, and turn here to see what I can do. Um, I don't think much is gonna happen here, but we'll, we'll see. Well, of course I'm snared, which sucks. Attack rolls against creature have advantage while the creature's attack rolls and deck saving throws have disadvantage. I won't be able to remove that unless. Okay. On the move. Why not? Why wouldn't I miss all three things? So it'd be totally part apropos for this entire video. Um. So these are cat. They're they're casting this on me, unfortunately. But if they were casting this on Carlac and I hadn't used my reaction earlier. I could maybe weaponize my reaction back to do some fun stuff. So just to kind of show off what this character can do, how it can really be a very, very fun character doing a ton of really cool stuff. And I think that this is, again, a very cookie cutter type of character. This is not a, a super unique one that no one's thought of. It's one that we've all thought of. The one that I'm sure there's plenty of guides online that exist, but it's one I really wanted to showcase because it is a really, really fun build that can do a ton of really cool stuff. And I really enjoy playing a character that kind of has like an answer for every little situation, right? That to me is always a really enjoyable way of playing. So, hey, you know what? We can use Polearm Cloud here. And I can do this if it hits. Okay, it didn't hit. But if that, if that were to hit, I could have actually used Divine Smite with it. So you can see we are just layering so much damage with all these uh, level one spell slots that we have access to from Divine Smite. Hey, <laughs> no, but still. Hopefully this gives you a really good idea of how to play a Vengeance Paladin, how to layer in a ton of fire damage with the, with the heat and burn mechanics, or how to really dive hard on that capability as a um, Vengeance Paladin. Because again, remember, we've got this Relentless Avenger. We can move that additional 15 feet. And I'm a Wood Elf, so I can move 
now 82 feet away. So I can have a long, long movement speed because of all this. A lot of mobility built into this character. And I hope you get a really good way or idea of how to play this character from this. But as always, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one. Take care.